This is an ABC podcast. Hello and welcome to Conversations for another year. We're back bright and shiny with a great, big, vast, astonishing trove of delightful, tragic, messy, weird and beautiful real-life stories just for you. Stories told by all kinds of different voices from all over the place. For a long, long while, the person with a stutter has struggled to be understood in a world that loves the gift of the gab. In the past, stuttering was often cruelly put down to a certain feebleness of mind or of the will. There's that scene in the movie The King's Speech where the father of the future King George VI just bellows at his son to pull himself together and spit it out. Damn it. Sigmund Freud thought the stutterer was racked with repressed desires. This, of course, is not only unhelpful, it's total rubbish. And I discovered this by reading a book by Jonty Claypole. Jonty started stuttering at an early age. He was given therapy that helped him navigate his way through speech, finding alternative pathways that went around difficult words. This helped him a great deal, but he still dreaded being asked to read aloud in the classroom. When Jonty reached his 30s, the stutter started to get worse again. But this time the therapy concentrated on removing the awful burden of shame that he'd carried for years as the guy who couldn't quite get his words out, who held up the conversation. Jonty Claypole is a man with an inquiring mind. He's a documentary maker and he's the former director of arts at the BBC. And yet he realised he knew so very little about this condition that had weighed on him all his life. Jonty has written a completely fascinating book that uncovers a whole world I never knew about. His book is called Words Fail Us in Defence of Disfluency. Hello, Jonty. Hello, Richard. The King's Speech, I'm going to start there. There's the climax of the movie, the coronation speech that King George VI gives after careful, careful coaching and preparation from the Australian speech therapist Lionel Logue. It's a scene with a lot of music behind it and people are shown being inspired by it. But is that what really happened when King George VI gave that speech in that flat tone? No. The great myth, and thanks to that wonderful film, is that uh, George overcomes his stutter or, or at least... Uh, learns to manage it in a way that doesn't impede on his ability to to rule. And, and, and that's because the film is Hollywood. It needs a Hollywood ending. In fact, George never overcame his, um, his stutter. It remained with him and with his broadcasts right beyond his coronation, right through the war, uh, right until he, he died. And uh, this became of interest to me because uh, it made me think, why is it important, uh, looked at through a Hollywood lens, looked at through a storytelling lens, that George should overcome his his stutter? Uh, and and that, for me, triggered an inquiry about the role stuttering has in our society, the way we see it, the stigma around it, and whether that's something that can be can be changed. The movie sort of implies that implies, doesn't come out and say so, but it implies that his stutter arises from a trauma inflicted on him when his nanny refused to feed him as a little boy and that Lionel Logue, and this is very Hollywood too, Lionel Logue got him to get past it by unburdening himself of his royal family repressions and torment and become a more natural human being and being more comfortable in his own skin. What do you think about all that, Chanting? That is just... The idea that stuttering is prompted by some sort of childhood trauma is just one of the aspects of the ghastly legacy of Freudianism and psychoanalysis on on our understanding of uh, uh, stuttering. We now know neurological. It's it's uh, it's something that some people are, uh, are are born with. It's hereditary. It's something to do in the wiring of the brain. But the idea that the stutterer was somebody who experienced some sort of trauma as a child that then expressed itself through stuttering is is very much the legacy of of Freud and it's it's something that shouldn't have been in the king's speech because by that point we knew that was false but again it's very hollywood it's very hollywood and it's convenient for storytelling but what do people say 
about the way King George VI communicated privately and personally? Well, it, it's very hard to know that, actually, because the royals, uh, even more so then than now, and it's it's particularly different since, of course, Netflix have broadcast uh, Harry and, May, uh, and Meghan's uh, sort of private thoughts and feelings. But we don't know a great deal privately about George's speech, except it clearly wasn't the same problem for him in his private life as it was for him in his public life. Because the reality is, is that if you have a stutter like uh, like George's, King George's, it's it's something that's a little bit problematic when talking to friends. You get stuck on some words. You repeat yourselves a bit. Uh, it it can be very frustrating, but it's not completely debilitating. But there was something about his stutter in the public sphere that became deeply, deeply problematic, not only for him as a ruler, but also for the nation at large. When he gave those speeches, particularly during the Second World War, there was a sense that if you have a ruler who can't speak fluently, who can't get their sentences out, then how on earth is this country going to survive uh, the onslaught of the Nazis? It, it, it became a sim- it became a symbol, and and therefore George uh, King George effectively tortured himself to try and give uh, speeches that were entirely fluent. He would not allow himself to stutter at all. And in doing so, with Lionel Logue, he 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 only began to manage it by speaking in this very machine-like way, uh, in in which uh, they called it three-word breaks. So you would break sentences down into three parts, and th- even then he would often uh, uh, block, which is the technical term for when you can't get a word out, just before a three-word break. There's an amazing description from a uh, mass observation researcher uh, from 1945. Now, mass observation was this amazing movement in which volunteers went out and recorded conversations around Britain and wrote them down. And one of the mass observation researchers goes to a pub when George is doing his uh, Victory Day speech. It's, It's the end of the war. The pub is full. This is... After this, the war is over. And uh, the researcher, she describes the reaction of people in the pub when George is giving his speech. And and it's a scene of profound anxiety. There's total silence in the pub. People are hugging their drinks. And when George starts to speak, they all wear these very agonised expressions. And then very quickly, about 10 seconds in, he blocks on a word. And she describes looking around the room and seeing people with kind of pocket expressions and sort of lacerated looks. And then George gets the words out and moves on to the, the, the next moment. And that scene, for me became uh was something that sort of triggered what I was trying to do in this book because it 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 just brought the question to me why why did it matter so much to people and why was George torturing himself so much given that people who knew him did often speak of how their affection for him he seemed to be quite charming and lovely to be in the presence of in a private sense do you think he might have been better off speaking more comfortably if that was ever going to be possible in his normal voice, rather than this flattened that 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 thing that Lionel Lowe taught him to. Completely. So so lots of accounts of his speeches by famous diarists and so on. They they say that his speech it's like hearing a broken typewriter, says says uh, says one writer, and, and another says this awful machine-like patter. So he sounded like a dysfunctioning robot when he was uh, speaking. So he, it would have you been mean much... Like in his speeches, you mean? In uh, his speeches, yes. yeah. So if he had... Uh, uh, and that's because he was doing everything not to stutter at all. If he'd gone on the radio and spoken in his own voice, not worrying about these three-word breaks and this particular technique of talking, he would have stuttered quite a lot, but he would have sounded rather warm and he would have sounded like a human being. And I think that's infinitely preferable. To me, it sounds like it'd be like trying to give a speech, but you're under a rule where you're not allowed to say the word the or something like that. Yes. And you've got to give a speech that somehow skirts its way. The kind of mental agility is required for that is is very, very, very difficult. So he might, yes, as you say, he might well have been better off speaking in his more natural voice. How old were you, Jonty, when it was realised there was something going on with your speech? So I was about four or five. Like most children, I became first aware that 
adults were concerned about my speech rather than being aware that something was wrong uh, with my speech. Because at that age, you don't really notice. But what you do notice is the way adults are responding when you when you talk and the things they start to say about your... So you had no sense of a disability uh, uh, until your parents could tell you that there was something wrong? Yes, yeah. And, and, and then once you're made aware of it, you start to, you start, uh, uh, to notice it. There's a very uh, important speech therapist in the history of speech pathology called Wendell Johnson, who was a stutterer himself, uh, an American in the 1930s. And he famously said... A stutter begins in a parent's ear rather than in a child's mouth. And so it's something that adults hear rather than a child themselves being being aware of. And he also said, and which is true, it's a developmental thing that many, many, many children go through for a couple of months. And uh Really? Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. And, so it's something that can be exacerbated then by this kind of intense concentration and concern. Perhaps? Yeah. So, 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 suppose you were to fall over and hurt hurt your knee a bit and limp for a few days. Uh, if after a day everyone was saying, "Look at you! You're limping! You're limping! This isn't good! You're limping! You'll be lame forever! <laughs> You'll be lame forever!" Right. So, so uh, <laughs> the the theory, and, and there's a reasonable amount of evidence to support this, yeah. is that if you tell a five year old there's something wrong with your speech, you're stuttering, you're stuttering, oh, the child's going to yeah. develop a complex about it, become very nervous about speaking and will stutter more. But is that how it was for you? And are you the only stutterer or stammerer in your family? No, uh, my mother started to. Uh, uh, it's, so the, it is hereditary. Uh, she was a uh, she was a Sydney girl who who became a, a a news journalist, but stopped because in her early twenties, she found that at a news conference, when you ask questions and you have to say Annie Woodham's her name from whichever paper, she would stutter on her name, and so she 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 changed career uh, uh, effectively. So my mother did as well. Yeah, is there a and you've married a woman who has a stutter or has had a stutter. And, and is, there a, is there a tribal thing that goes on there, do you think? I, I, I think there is. And so the uh, book is dedicated to my wife. And I say in brackets, to love at first stutter. Because the first <laughs> time we, we met, we were introduced by a friend. She stuttered when she said, said her name. She blocked and stuttered. And you thought, I'm in love. I thought, I'm in love. <laughs> so it was love at first sight. But, but I say uh, stutter instead. But her father stutters and her brother does as as as, uh, <laughs> as well. So between us, we look at our children and think, <laughs> when's this going to start? So, so there are indications that there is there, it might be hereditary. Uh, oh yeah, when it comes it's, to these things. Yeah, but there's even been a gene identified, which is now looked at as the stuttering gene. And what was it like when you got married and these two tribes were brought together? Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> Uh, on our wedding day, uh, everyone giving a speech, the father of the bride, the bride and uh, myself, all of us over our adult years had discovered through through the stutterer's secret circle that beta blockers help help you when you're doing public speaking. They uh, They enable you to be more fluent. So we are all popping beta blockers <laughs> together before <laughs> handing them around the family to uh, 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 prepare ourselves to give speeches. Hey, man, you got any beta blockers? Was it like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, shh, have you got any beta blockers? So what kind of therapy did you receive, speech therapy did you receive as a child? So as a child, I, I, uh, uh, I was very lucky. I, there was uh, in, in London in the 1980s, an experimental unit was established that, that pioneered a new approach to speech therapy that looked at following Wendell Johnson's theories, who I mentioned before, that stuttering isn't just something that happens in somebody's mouth. It's something, uh, it's it, it's also defined by how people respond to it. This pioneering uh, stuttering clinic set up in the 1980s uh, put the whole family into therapy. So they said, it's it's not enough for us to treat your children. We need to treat the whole family and work out what the family dynamic is that is exacerbating this, this problem. So they had me, my sister, my mum, my dad in a boot camp for, for two weeks 
where I was in, in, in one room having my speech deconstructed effectively. We were taught to speak from scratch using a technique called smooth speech, where you uh, learn to speak uh, very smoothly, running words together and gradually increase the tempo. But meanwhile, in another room, my family was being interrogated about <laughs> the, the toxic environment <laughs> that, uh, that might be making this so, so problematic. Spit it out, boy! Yes. Like, but, and I don't think your, your childhood was like that, was it? Your no, mum was sympathetic and yeah. they, they, they knew what was going on. And, and, did, and this helped you, though, didn't it? Yeah, it, it, it helped me immensely. But it was still, I was less an overt... St I mean, one of the things I talk about uh, in in the, the book is that everyone listening today will know more stutterers than they think they do because most stutterers as adults, they become what's called interiorised stutterers. What so, is that? What does that mean, interiorised so, stutterers? Uh, as, as we get older, because human beings are very good at survival and you've experienced at school these rather traumatic incidents of being teased and bullied because of a stutter, you develop a whole grammar of techniques for concealing your, your stutter. Uh, you, uh, for instance, substitute words. If you can see a, a problematic word coming along, you substitute in different words. So, so uh, instead of saying problematic, you'd say tricky. In other yes, words. yes, and we carry a, a large thesaurus. This is we interiorised stutterers. We carry a large thesaurus of words in, in our heads. We mo uh, modulate the pitch of our voices. So we speak and sometimes we'll go into a sing-song patter. We'll speak quickly, then slowly. So, so we have this very baroque range of techniques that help us to hide the fact that we uh, uh, stutter. And most stutterers I know after adulthood are interiorised stutterers. But it comes at a great cost because you find yourself avoiding uh, certain words, certain sounds. It means you could... I've had periods of my life where I've spoken in a very sort of eccentric, convoluted way. You avoid situations. People who are interiorised stutterers hate the beginning of meetings, say, where you say your name, but because it's a word you, you can't avoid. Your name is your name. Uh, uh, and you end up saying ridiculous things like, you know, you all know me. Uh, you end up choosing career paths that are go. I didn't take the career path I wanted to do. Most people who are interiorised stutterers don't. We look for career paths where we can conceal the fact that, that we stutter. You, of all things, though, nonetheless went into broadcasting, joined the BBC, became a documentary maker, rose to become the Director of Arts, a very, very senior position in not just the BBC but in British life. And you put this down to being something of a linguistic groupie. Can you explain what you mean by being a linguistic groupie? Well, I wanted to act, but, but, but by the age of 12, it was apparent that I couldn't because in school plays I would, I, I would block on uh, and stutter on words so, so I couldn't act, but I was always drawn to people who, who can and I've always been drawn to people who have the gift of the gab. And that was what drew me into broadcasting as a producer, was that I loved working with people for whom speaking was effortless. And when they did, this, these wonderful, fluent turns of phrase would come out. And I dedicated my life to enabling that. And so that's why I call myself a, a linguistic groupie. It, it, it was only in my mid-30s when I began to uh, uh, look more deeply at the impact stuttering has had on my life, that I realised there was something slightly pathetic about this, that I and that it came partly from self-loathing as well as admiration that I despised the way I, that I spoke and therefore was excessively in awe of people who spoke in a way that I believed I couldn't. Well, you write this this came about because you found yourself in your early thirties with the stutter sort of reappearing and getting worse, and so you did a different kind of form of speech therapy in London. Tell me about this course and the approach that this took to treating a few of the underlying problems involved in the stutter. Yeah, so as a kid, speech therapy was all about making your speech more fluent uh, and fluent. Now, in, in my early 30s, my stutter, for whatever reasons, got, got very bad uh, uh, again. And, and I remember... 
uh, I was on a, I, I worked in documentaries. I was on a, a location shoot, and I was trying to give orders to my, uh, to my crew and my presenter. And I was stuttering so badly at the time. And I remember my cameraman I was working with laughing and stamping his foot and imitating my stutter. And of course, that's a terrible, uh, I mean, for them, it was quite funny. But for me, it was a terrible, humiliating moment. So what did you do? So I signed up to a course at an adult education college in London uh, uh, called City Lit. And I signed up to a stuttering group therapy course and i i went along one very wet night in in winter to this uh institutional room in in central london where there were a whole group of about 10 uh people like me who were mostly interiorized stutterers so we were mostly people who were hiding it but were finding it increasingly difficult to do so I was very struck. I mean, it was like Alcoholics Anonymous in that we in that we sat in a circle and we basically began the first session by saying our names and saying that we were a stutterer. The thing you'd always dreaded. And I mm. remember the guy next to me saying that uh, he was in, so in interiorised that nobody in his life knew that he had this stutter that he was hiding the entire time. Not even his girlfriend knew. And that for me was a it was an extreme version of myself because you know my girlfriend and, and friends knew uh and then the the speech therapist who was running the course said look i'm sorry to disappoint you all we're not going to be able to cure your stutter we can't it, it can't be done what we can do is help you to live with it and think differently about that and the way we're going to do that is through exposure therapy we're going to send you out in the streets and uh make you uh stutter walk up to people and stutter sometimes you're you're going to stutter naturally sometimes we're going to get you to fake a stutter we're going to get you doing this in your workplaces we're going to get you doing it again and again and again and again until you are desensitized to it and everyone in the room was horrified because we thought, we've turned up, you're going to cure us, right? And that was what <laughs> happened over the next few months. I remember it, it was the most, or at least one of the most uh, difficult nights of my life it was the first night we were sent outside onto the streets in pairs. And uh, me and my partner had to stand outside Hoban tube station and stop people passing by. And we were told... Uh, ask for the directions for Covent Garden and you might stutter, but if you don't, fake a stutter. Fake and a the stutter. the most important thing is look the person in the eye when you stutter because uh, when you stutter, you always break eye contact. Stutterers cannot look anyone in, in the eye out of shame. And so I stood there and I was so nervous, I didn't know if I could do it. And then I stopped someone and said, excuse me, can you tell me the way to... And I looked them in the eyes as I did it. And I'd never done it. I'd never looked someone in the eyes as I stuttered. And uh, and it, it, it was exhilarating. And then I said Covent Garden. And then we just did it again and again and again. Now, mostly the response was very positive. You, you discover that when you look someone in the eyes, they're not laughing at you. They're, they, they're not thinking, you know, what an idiot. But, you know, one person did laugh. One person looked at me and laughed and walked on. Uh, so, you know... The big deal. Big in the deal. End. Yeah. Um, you know, when you give a speech, you realise that what the audience really wants from the person who's giving the speech is not to be loud or brash necessarily or be this or that or whatever or not to stutter or any of those things. What they want, what an audience wants from a speechmaker is authority. And the act of looking someone in the eye is more powerful than the stutter. Yeah. And this is something you just discovered by looking someone in the eye and saying, can you give me directions to Co 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 Covent Garden? Yeah. There was dignity in that. Was that is that it? Yes, yes. It was uh, dignity. And also they then... the. Uh, Did you laugh? Sorry? Did you, you... Was it kind of joyful? Well, afterwards I was high. Yeah. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, I, I, was, I was so exhilarated. And then they had us doing it at work. And so, and yes, sort of very importantly, the technique of fake stuttering and looking in the eye was very important because it was empowering, because you were in control. I was in control of the stutter because I was faking it and I was looking them in the, in, in, in the eye. So th th there was dignity. It, it was very empowering. And that was when I had this road to Damascus moment where having done that the first night, 
I went home and I began thinking. And I thought to myself, my entire life, I, I've been running from this thing and hiding from it. And as a result, I haven't even wanted to know anything about it. And at that point, when I was 33, I'd chosen my career based on uh, on my stutter. I'd I, I'd constructed my whole way of speaking about it. And yet I was so ashamed of it. I didn't want to know anything about it. So at that stage, I couldn't even tell you what stuttering was. I couldn't tell you if it was... Uh, a physiological problem, if it was a neurological one. I didn't know anything about the history of how it's been treated. I didn't really know other people who started, except for these other rather shamefaced individuals I met in I met in group therapy classes. Jody, this sounds so much like the the torment of a closeted gay man or woman in the 1950s, for example. Yes. Isn't it a similar thing to that? Y this kind of pointless shame. Yeah, and we talk about it as coming out as well. You do? Yeah, so th that moment triggered the whole journey I went on that led to me writing the book because I, I thought, I, I, I need to know about this thing and I need to find other people who do it as, do it, uh, as well. You said you were on a high after you went on this exercise, going out in public like that. Why? What was, what was, was something given to you or something taken away? It was the uh, something was given to me, and it it was the bungee jumping high. It 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 was facing the most uh, terrifying thing you can imagine, doing it and surviving. Uh, it it was that high. This is conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. I have a comedian friend of mine, well, a friend of mine is a former comedian and an author as well who has a stutter and found Jonty that when he would go on stage, he never stuttered and he could deliver devastatingly funny lines no problem at all, but he had that slight stutter coming off it. Is this common? Do some stutterers go into acting because they find it's a world where they don't stutter? Yes, this is one of the amazing, astonishing, mysterious things about stuttering. It's, it's, it's one of the most variable and unpredictable of any conditions. So as a person who stutters, when you wake up in the morning, you have no idea how bad your uh, uh, condition is going to be that day. That's quite rare. If you've got a gammy leg, you wake up <laughs> you and your leg's leg. going to be gammy. Mm. Uh, whereas stuttering, you can find yourself, have, yourself having a very fluent day. You can find yourself virtually unable to speak. Perhaps the greatest mystery of all is that most people who stutter, uh, uh, even people who stutter very badly, find that when they're acting, if they act or speaking a foreign language, the stutter can almost entirely clear up. And that is why many, many people uh, 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 who stutter go into acting. And some of our most famous actors are people who stutter. Like so, who? Uh, Marilyn Monroe. Uh, no. Was, she, Marilyn Monroe? Her husky, sexy voice was a uh, a voice she developed to conceal her, her stutter. She didn't naturally speak in that happy birthday, Mr. President way. It was something she developed as a way of, as a form of kind of everyday life acting to conceal her stutter. Uh, John Bell, Australia's John Bell, has said that he went into acting because of his stutter. Emily Blunt, Nicole Kidman... Uh, it's 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 a sort of long uh, Samuel L. Jackson, uh, etc. What so, so really? Th there are many. Wow. And Emily Blunt was uh, interviewed recently, and she said precisely that that she, her stutter was very debilitating for her at school. She had a very inspiring teacher who said, "I've heard if you have a stutter and you act, it doesn't happen." She did a school play, didn't stutter, and that was it. Became an actor. Can people who stutter? in one language, be fluent when they speak another language. Yes. So many people who stutter uh, become linguists because they find that if they're speaking 
French or Italian or something, they don't they don't stutter at all. I'm the opposite. I cannot speak foreign languages. Every time I've learned, tried to learn, my speech disintegrates into a string of blocks and stutters. And the same for acting. I but most I'm the exception to the rule. Joe Biden. President Joe Biden has been happy to talk about the fact that he grew up with a stutter. Now, when he launched the new AUKUS alliance with Boris Johnson and Scott Prime Minister Scott Morrison, he turned to Scott Morrison and didn't call him Scott Morrison, called him that fellow from down under. How is that related to his ingrained stutter, do you think, John Dean? So, uh, Joe Biden's narrative about himself is he had a childhood uh, disability, his stutter, and he overcame it and became president of the United States. This is very common in presidential narratives that uh, when you're running for president, you tell a story about yourself that you have a you have an obstacle as a child that you overcome, and, and that's why you're presidential. Oh, it's the log material. cabin narrative, isn't it? That's the thing. You you had dire poverty like Nixon, or you had uh, an alcoholic uh, stepfather like Clinton. You've got this narrative. You overcame this childhood thing, and you became president. Exactly. So Joe Biden's been very uh, open and transparent, which is wonderful about how debilitating his stutter was as a child, as a young man. However. We in the stuttering community know that he never overcame his his stutter. And we know this because when we see him speak, we recognise the symptoms of an interiorised stutterer, of, of, of somebody who is constantly concealing the blockages and stutters in, in, in their speech. And, and a number of things have now been written about by people who stutter about Joe Biden's stutter. At the same time as Joe Biden was running for president and saying, I used to be a person who stuttered and overcame it, he was also becoming known as what he himself calls a gaffe machine. He gets words wrong. He says he seems to forget things. Uh, so, for instance, in in one event a few years ago, he appeared to forget the name of his then boss, Barack Obama. Biden was vice president at the time and said, my boss. Uh, he He pauses and says, my boss. And all of the sort of Republican press with, you know, Joe Biden, so senile, can't even remember the name of his his boss. If you look at that speech, uh, what you, you, you see that he's about to say Barack Obama and his mouth stops on the B. And then he pivots and says, my boss instead. So, so that's just like that thing you were saying when you're at a meeting and you've all got to say your name, you go, well, you know who I am. Is, is it, You recognise that as a stutterer, as one of those kind of those roundabout evasions. Yes, and so Joe Biden still stutters, but he he hides the fact he does, and he hides from words which are problematic. And when he gives speeches, as a person who stutters, you see when he's speaking, periodically his mouth will pucker on a sound and then quickly pivot oh. to something else. So what does so, that tell so, you? What does that tell you, that he would rather be seen as someone who has, who's going senile rather than being recognised as a stutterer. Well, it, it tells you the still terrible stigma that there is around stuttering. And so he, yeah, and Trump, who all through the election campaign was, you know, saying, you know, talking about Sleepy Joe and, uh, you know, he's going senile, Biden and his campaign team had clearly made a calculated decision that that was going to be easier to weather <laughs> than being a person who stutters. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so... It, it it tells us the extent to which this stigma, this uh, sense that a stutter is not, a stutter is 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 not a whole person, it's a broken person, still persists in our society. So I'm afraid to to say to anyone out there who's not a fan of Scott Morrison and 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 had a gleeful response when Biden appeared not to remember his name. Biden probably could remember his name, but was realised he was about to stutter on it, and so pivoted to that fella down under instead. I think for me the most fascinating part of your book, Jonty, was the chapter about Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. I can't tell you how important these books are to me. They were the first proper books I read on my own as a child and I think they changed the way I see the world. I don't know. I, I've never read books that 
change the way I see the world like those books. And I, they got me at a very, very powerful age. And I still adore them and read them to my own kids. I absolutely love them. How much was stuttering a part of Lewis Carroll's life? So stuttering was the, it was the central conflict in his his life. And nobody, for some reason, knows this. Uh, biographers even rarely uh, mention it. We're obsessed when we look at Lewis Carroll, we're obsessed about his obsession with Alice Little, whether his interest in children was uh, unwholesome, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What we pay very little attention to is, is, is the fact that all through his life, he is uh, deeply troubled and trying to manage a stutter. The, the first poem he writes when he's about eight or nine is a, a sort of list of uh, commands that his father gives. And Two of them is uh, don't stutter. And then at the end, he says, once again, don't stammer. And at the end of his life, Lewis Carroll, a few days before he dies, is writing to a friend saying, talking about the stutter, which has been the the prime, prime obstacle throughout his, his life. It was so uh, problematic for him that in uh, 1860, he participates in one of the first... Uh, endeavours of group therapy in history. There's a speech therapist called James Hunt who opens up a residency for stutterers on the south coast of England. And was he a young man at this stage, was he? Uh, he, he yes, he's, he, he's in Not his 20s. Right. Okay. And Lewis Carroll is so desperate that he pays a lot of money and goes and spends several weeks in Hastings. Uh, remarkable scenes. We think of group therapy today and we imagine people dress like ourselves. And you have to imagine people in Victorian frock coats and possibly top hats sitting around a in a circle <laughs> talking about their feelings because that's what was, uh, that's what was going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is, is that it's there, it, it's, it's in this group that Lewis Carroll meets Charles Kingsley, author of The Water Babies, and George MacDonald, author of, uh, future author of The Princess and the Goblin. So these three men who invent fantasy fiction meet in the salon of this speech therapist. And after uh, Lewis Carroll goes back to Oxford, that's when the great turn happens in his, in his life, in his imagination. He starts to write those very playful letters, letters which are kind of formed of cir sort of words forming circles. He starts to write nonsense poetry and tell nonsense stories. Jabberwocky. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, and he's realised that like one of the things that James Hunt, the therapist, teaches, and we know this because we have his book, is that language is very, very unreliable, and so we shouldn't take it so seriously. That's what he's teaching, and and so it's after this that these three men, including Lewis Carroll, go and start playing with language and start to invent fantasy fiction. So if you looked at one way, Alice in Wonderland is constantly playing with language and. So if you remember very early in Alice in Wonderland, Alice and the animals are caught in a great flood of Alice's tears and they say we need to get dry afterwards. Uh, uh, so one of the animals t decides to tell a very dry uh, uh, story about William the Conqueror, you know. <laughs> so so Lewis Carroll's showing that dry can mean two different things. It's an, un unreli it's an unreliable, unreliable word, right. And then yeah. the, the mouse decides to tell his own tale and the mouse's tale, if you remember on the page is a story of words in the shape of, of a mouse's tail. So so language goes very slippery in Wonderland. And, and there's a scene in, in Looking Glass where the red and white queen, they're trying to have a conversation and they can't because they're punning so much. They 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 can't say what they mean. They can't get a handle on on language. So, you know, there's a, there's a, I was always interested as an adult in Alice in Wonderland and, and particularly in Through the Looking Glass. I think that's the better of the two, funnily enough. Yeah. But I, I was really interested in the way he seems to anticipate the totalitarian uh, terrors of the 20th century. He's writing well before this, but he seems to anticipate Nazism and Stalinism. There's that scene where Alice encounters Humpty Dumpty on the wall and Humpty Dumpty says, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. And then Humpty yes. Dumpty corrects her and says, the question is, which is to be master. That's all. Wow. Now that I know 
that he was a stutterer, yeah. that changes the whole meaning of that passage yeah. for me. Yeah. That's astonishing to, yeah. to read that. So are you saying that Lewis Carroll then, having gone through this therapy, can approach language, doesn't see language as something you love, it's not a good friend, it's a, it's a, it's, it's more of a kind of an unreliable tool? Yes, it's, it's an unreliable tool and uh, something he, 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 and he wants to expose that unreliability and, and gain some mastery over it. Fascinatingly, he even stutters Alice in Wonderland into existence. Alice Liddell, who is for whom he, you know, he wrote the, the story, she recalled it in later life. She, she said that he uh, he told the story stuttering. That, so she remembered him stuttering as he told the story, and that was the story he then wrote down. So so it's literally stuttered into ex- existence. And just to come back to your point, in Jabberwocky, this poem in Nonsense, which still we can somehow make sense of. There's this dragon or, or monster called the Jabberwocky and a young knight slays it. Uh, some school children wrote to Lewis Carroll at one point and went, what is this poem about? And Lewis Carroll wrote back, it's the only time he tried to explain it, but he writes to them and says, well, it's mostly... A, a, the word Jabberwocky comes from Anglo-Saxon words and looked at through an Anglo-Saxon prism... The Jabberwocky is the offspring, is the child of uh, uh, jabbered speech. and uh, Like a jabbering monster. Yes, it's a jabbering monster. And that's what you do when you stutter, is, is you start to, to jabber. And so the Jabberwocky, he said, is the offspring of this. And he sends out this young knight in the poem to slay the offspring. <laughs> of, uh, so so it's, it, it's there all the way through. Just another fascinating thing is Lewis Carroll wasn't his name, as we know. It was Charles Dodgson, and he changes his name to Lewis Carroll. He also, and and, and this I find completely fascinating, he writes in his uh, diaries that the hardest sound he faces as a stutterer, he calls it his his vanquisher in single uh, in single armed combat is the hard C sound. He says that's a sound he can never say. He'll go into a shop and try and ask for cotton wool, and he 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 won't be able to get it out. And yet the name he gives himself when he could choose any name in the world begins with a hard C. It's Carol. And I uh, and so uh, I think he he, he must deliberately be, be taking the hardest sound he faces and stuttering in language and making that his signature, making that his name. Now that brings us to the secret superpower that many stutterers have. You talked there about how Lewis Carroll, okay, Charles Dodson, spun the tale of Alice in Wonderland while at a picnic somewhere with Alice Little, just began to, in this kind of furious, stuttering, storytelling ecstasy, just started to spill it out, he make, inventing the tale as he went along, seeing a rabbit hole and the little girl goes down the rabbit hole in his mind, there's all the creatures down there, there's the eat me, drink me thing, there's the the, the pool of tears, all of that, then there she goes into the garden of talking flowers and all of, and he's just spinning this on the spot, this extraordinary tale, on the spot in what Alice later remembered was a kind of a, a, a kind of a delirious ecstasy. What does that tell you about the mind of the stutterer, the ability to have all these cognitive gears whirring in their head at super speed. It it shows that they become linguistic masters. And once they become linguistic masters, the stories start pouring out. This isn't just sort of me making stuff up. We know from brain scans that when people who stutter speak, the linguistic parts of their brains are on fire (laughs) because they've got so many different... They're looking for different words, different ways to say things. There's a beautiful line by David Mitchell, the author of Cloud Atlas, who who had a very bad stutter as a kid, where where he says, that kid in the schoolroom with the stutter, who you think is the most linguistically incompetent person in the school, he's the linguistic genius and you just don't know it. And and, and once you have that linguistic power, it starts spilling out into stories. And and, and, and that's why so many great writers like Somerset Maugham uh, and Henry James and Colm Tobin are all people who have had very, very bad stutters. Colm <laughs> Tobin, finding out he was a stutter, that knocked my socks off. I interviewed him once. He was such a charmer. He spoke so beautifully. I never would have guessed with him 
man, that really took me by surprise, I have to say. Yeah, and and, and he told me of an incident where he was doing a radio broadcast uh, uh, a few years ago and it all came back and it, he, he just stopped in his tracks oh. mid, mid-broadcast. So, so yes, it's uh, it's uh, uh, in some ways it's it, it, if harnessed properly, it is a, it is a superpower because uh, it turns you into a storyteller and a, a versatile linguist. You have this big database of synonyms in your head; you can reach for it any any time, like a huge, huge thesaurus that's always open and always available to yeah. you. You mentioned there all those literary names: Henry James, Somerset Maugham, John Updike, yeah. Con Tobin who found solace in the written world. And this brings us to music. This is true of so many musicians, people who've lived with a stutter. Ed Sheeran, Carly Simon, Kendrick Lamar, and the blues artists, John Lee Hooker and B.B. King. Tell me about what you found about the connection between stuttering and the origin of blues music. Yeah, uh, so two of the great blues giants, John Lee Hooker and B.B. King, had had bad stutters, and they don't hide it. They they talk about it. B.B. King writes about it in his autobiography. Hooker has a song called um, Stuttering Blues, and they both turn to the blues as a form of music, and they develop the blues as a form of music, uh, what's called the talking blues, because they find they can communicate this way. Once you're into the talking blues... There's a, a rhythm to speech and there's the music and they find they no longer stutter. So, you know, their songs, and particularly John Lee Hooker's songs, are quite elaborate. They're 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 ways of communicating and uh and and talking. What I find fascinating is that the only area of our lives and our culture where there is no stigma around stuttering is in blues and rock and roll music. And, and, and I think it goes back to B.B. King and John Lee Hooker. So you then start to hear it in the sort of white uh, r- rock and rollers in the 60s and 70s. If you remember uh, uh, the Kink song with... Uh, uh, no, it's The Who, it's my generation, where there's um, a, a fake stutter the whole way... Why don't you all my... just f- 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 fade away and m- talking about my j- 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 yeah. Jan? Or... And this song became a sex sort of symbol for people. It was the most sort of, it was one of the sexiest, most exciting things. And yet, if you're a person who stutters, you were listening to it saying, they're stuttering. <laughs> How is this? And you hear it again and again. There are live versions of Led Zeppelin singing uh, songs where Robert Plant will fake a stutter on the word boogie. He'll stop and say, you know, why don't you just let your boy. And then just block on the word boogie and say buh, buh. And you can hear the women in the crowd screaming. Uh, and then he says boogie. I think John Lee Hooker said that, giving a nod to John Lee Hooker's stutter. So in in this one area, stuttering becomes a kind of sex symbol. Uh, in, 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 uh, and yet it's never broken out outside of that. So the thing that you've found very, very helpful is that course you did, that group therapy you did where stutterers like you were encouraged to look people in the eye and just talk and be comfortable with stuttering. What about the rest of us who don't stutter? What advice do you have for people when who don't stutter, who encounter people who do stutter in conversation? Yeah, that, I I think there's just some very simple rules of thumb. I I, I don't want to overburden people with a, a <laughs> checklist of things to do, do and don't do. But I think there's uh, don't finish people's sentences or, or words for them, w- which is often the temptation when you encounter someone who stutters. Because you'll to, often get it wrong. I mean, that's the thing. Well, you, you might get it, and it, 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 it it's it's uh, it's very emasculating to have somebody mm. take your words uh, from you. I think also I, I I think if you know someone with a bad stutter, uh, like any form of disability, the temptation is just not really to communicate with them because. It's it, it feels so fraught, and of course that's very isolating and lonely. And I think uh, so. It's very important not to avoid not to avoid uh, communicating. And finally, I think it's very important to remember that uh, not to discriminate. That there's nothing there's nothing about a person who stutters that is that is infantile. That they've got they're blocked on some Freudian trauma. They're just some logical difference that means they physiologically have a bit of trouble getting their words out and that's it. You write a bit about the the kind of the deceptive beauty of the TED talk where someone gets on stage, there's a lot of drama around it, the stage is dark and someone comes out, they're very fluent, they're very charming, they've got a great anecdote that indicates everything 
you thought about the subject was wrong and here's the the real truth of it. And we walk away with a kind of a message of that, the, the beguiling, the allure of the TED Talk. What, have you thought about doing an anti-TED Talk, like a stutterer's TED Talk where you kind of address all this? Because I'm kind of conscious of the fact that although you're critical of TED Talks, uh, it turned out like just about everything I thought I knew about stuttering was wrong. Um, have you thought about doing something like that, Jonty? Uh, no, <laughs> but perhaps I, perhaps I should. But I, 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 I was interested in the TED talk because in the book I, I, I didn't want to just write about people who have speech disorders. I wanted to write about the anxieties that language gives all of us. The uh, in polls, the third biggest anxiety after snakes and heights is the fear of public speaking. So. All of us have some degree of fear around around speaking, particularly in a uh, public space. And so it it seems to me that culturally we've created a lot of pressure and, and a lot of heat around how we feel we're supposed to be able to speak. And and and, and this is particularly true in our, our working lives where we're expected to be able to give PowerPoint presentations or talks. And we've made the idea of speaking very, very problematic and uh, uh, daunting. And, and one of the things I want to do in the book is by looking at stuttering in a different way, just take the heat out of uh, public speaking more more generally and say, it's okay to be, to be, a, to get stuck on words a bit or be a bit in an articulate we don't need to be those those ted talkers that's not normal it's a performance johnny what a pleasure it is to speak with you about all this this has been completely fascinating thank you so much thank you johnny claypole's book is called words fail us in defense of disfluency i'm richard feidler thanks for listening You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.